啊，大家请合掌，请合掌。Let us join our palms。我们一起来称念本师释迦牟尼佛。Chant the name of our founding teacher, Namo Shyamuni Buddha. Namo Shyamuni Buddha. Namo founding teacher, Shyamuni Buddha. Namo founding teacher, Shyamuni Buddha. May we cherish the chance, this rare chance of encountering the Dharma, one in a million kalpas opportunity, so that we can truly understand and practice the teachings of Lord Buddha. Respectful fellow practitioners. Good evening to you all, Amitofo. Today, we will continue to uh, our practice uh, giving speech to you all on this topic of uh, understanding Buddhism. Originally, it was supposed to happen yesterday, Wednesday, but because yesterday my um, body, uh, my physical condition has a little bit of um, issues, uh, coins sick a bit. So today I would like to um, uh, make up for yesterday uh, to explain uh, how we understand Buddhism. If during this uh, speech, if I have, um, you know, uh, make any uh, mistakes or mention anything doesn't sound right, please um, do not hesitate to give me feedback. Last week, we have uh, briefly talked about, in Buddhism, uh, the imageries of Buddha and Bodhisattvas and their purpose, their meaning. What are they trying to represent? And we understand that it is a very vast, there are vast meaning packed behind these imageries and names. In fact, it, has, it is infinite and it's not too much to describe it as infinite meaning. So to categorize everything, there, is a, there are two meanings. Uh, last week, uh, we talked about that, two meanings, but uh, of all the meanings, we must understand why we have names and so many names, so many images of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Uh, uh, there's, uh, only one purpose behind it, uh, be it Shayamuni Buddha, Amitabha Buddha, or Medicine Buddha, or Avalokitesvara, Guan Yin Buddha, Bodhisattva Guan Yin, uh, or Manjustri, Bodhisattva Manjustri. Uh, all these, they only have one meaning, one purpose, sorry, one purpose. It's to benefit all sentient beings. That's what they're trying to do. So from here we understand that all Buddhas from all directions, each Buddha when they become enlightened and become attain full Buddhahood, their method is infinite. There's a lot of ways to gain that. But they never left the principle of um, filial piety, of love and respect. Last week, we have uh, learned briefly about that, about the names and imageries of Bodhidharma and Bodhisattvas, but I would like to re-emphasize over here, and, and also further on that, I will add in anything we left out last week. So to, we talk about offerings right, to the image of Buddha and Bodhisattvas. There are two main meanings. Uh, number one is to repay our gratitude. 
这个报恩。Being aware of the kindness we receive and repay the gratitude. So we must know who are we aware of their kindness and who are we repaying the gratitude. In fact, it's actually teachers, not just Buddhas as the teacher, but all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and all teachers who contributed to our, you know, wisdom and our knowledge. Hence. We must truly、really、be grateful to our teachers.、Uh, hence,、uh, the words reaffirm the roots and retrace the beginning of our lineage educations. You know, who gave us that foundation? You know? So this is what we、um, talk about last week. So, as a student of Buddha, how do we repay the kindness? How do we repay them? In fact, the merits of our teacher, the kindness that we receive from our teacher, you know, the benefit is vast. In Sutra, Sahimani Buddha has categorized them into four kinds of kindnesses. There are four kinds. We all know. Number one is to repay their parents, repay the parents'、um, kindness. Repay our parents' kindness. We,、uh, we have heard of these four kinds of kindnesses above, but what do they mean?、Uh, some of us might not、uh, heard of it before, so we need to get,、uh, get in depth to it. So, first person we need to be grateful for is our parents. Number two is the teacher's kindness, the country's kindness, and then repaying all beings' kindness. The beings are not just sentient beings, but also non-sentient beings. I put some example like sunlight, oxygen, and home. To repay our parents' kindness, how do we repay them? Uh, if my parents are not here anymore, or my grandparents are not here anymore, as a children, grandchildren, how do we repay the kindness towards them? Their kindness. How do we repay them? In fact, we all know to repay.、Uh, the best way to repay them is to advise them, to you know, encourage them. To recite the name of Namo Amitabha Buddha, because、uh, you help them to plant the seeds for their、um, full happiness in future, no longer suffer. So this is one of the best and most well-rounded way to repay them, because you help them to truly liberate from the sufferings, to the sufferings of life and death, age, sickness, illness. Uh, no more six realms for them. No more these tortures. If they can chant Amitabha in this one lifetime, all the way to the last breath, and be born in pure land, this is the biggest gift, uh, kind, kindness, uh, biggest gratitude we can repay. What about our teachers? How do you repay them? Like Buddha is not here anymore, right? Our teacher, our original teacher, and he, but he left a lot of sutras, such a vast collections of teachings. How do we practice? How do we repay him?、Uh, in light of all the teachings he left behind. For example, if you can、uh, bring this understand Buddhism 
uh, to other people so that everyone uh, so that other people can uh, truly understand Buddhism's essence uh, so that they can revert from the misunderstanding towards Buddhism and most importantly they can truly benefit in practical way from these um, teachings uh, not just to the individuals but also to their family their communities and their countries and the world uh, so that everyone can live happily with each other without doubt without suspicions against each other they all can live in truly peace and prosperity. So that's the best way to repay Buddha's kind, uh, teacher's kindness, uh, our Buddha, the teacher's kindness. One way of doing so to reach this goal, noble goal, is to explain it to other people, whoever it is, no matter where you are, if you have this opportunity, uh, if they're interested, you can see they are interested, they could receive this, just tell them, just, just just say it, you know, on the spot, as much as they can take it. Uh, so, for example, what the person need, uh, how do I bring my family towards a nice uh, you know, happiness, how do I be, uh, achieve happiness, you know, not just myself, but with my family. And you heard of this uh, teachings, uh, and then you, you show it to them. Uh, how I do this, how I achieve happiness with my family. And this is what I learned from Buddha that enables me to achieve this uh, result. And then you show it to them. And so they too will learn from the teachings of Buddha and so their families and they all, you know, live happily together. And that's the best way to repay Shaimuni Buddha's kindness or Buddha's kindness. In summary, be a role model of one who truly benefited and cultivated these teachings and show it to them and help, help them to achieve the same thing as you are, same benefit or even more. In a bigger way is from, from this current, current benefit also to the benefit of future. Uh, the biggest benefit is to be pure, in Pure Land, become Bodhisattvas and Buddha. Through yourself, as an example, they will see how powerful and how beneficial Buddhism is towards them, the, the world. This is uh, something we need to know. So moving on to country's kindness. How do we pay, repay the kindness of our countries, countrymen? First thing is to build a nation. It's a very long and arduous process to build a nation how many people has to die how many sacrifices has to be made how many blood has to be shed so to repay all these people you know the dead people that fought for your nation or as a process of building this nation they died uh, so, so how do we repay it uh, first thing is the governor the governor and the government the person who governs, if they are not being virtuous, if they use laws for their own selfish means, then how can the people in this nation be happy? Start from the law. Everyone needs to obey the law, right? So that everyone can live peacefully together, not fear. And from there, we use Buddhism to spread all the moral teachings and virtuous teachings. Do not be greedy, do not be corrupted. Uh, put nations and people above yourself. So the last one is the beings. Uh, so not just sentient beings, uh, not living beings, but also non-sentient beings. All this environment that we are living in, we call environmentalism, right? We all rely on them to have a proper life, right? We need sunlight, we need oxygen, we need shelter. And not, of course, as a living being, without their services, how can we have a comfort life? Without people throwing your garbage, how can we have a clean environment? So those are all the being, all the kindness we need to repay. If you understand and truly aware, if we all understand and aware of these kindnesses, do we have the heart to harm them? Through our speech, through our thought, 
to our actions. Impossible. You can't. You just can't. Because once you see the world in this perspective, and to understand the gratitude that you have been received is immeasurable, then you will understand that uh, no matter what happens to you, uh, good or bad, favorable, adverse, uh, you remind yourself of these four kinds of kindnesses, uh, four types of gratitude to be repaid. Then we would not allow the hatred to grow, and our compassion will be stronger. So this is how this is what Shyamuni Buddha's mission is in this book: is to educate us through role modeling. What do they try to educate? What do they role model on being a human? How do we be a decent human being? See, for example, we saw an image of a Buddha in front of us, or a Guan Yin a Bodhisattva in front of us, a Pusa Bodhisattva in front of us. They're all there to educate us, to remind us how do we become a decent human being. The roots of a happy human existence, happy human life, is being grateful. To. For example, a family, if you want a family to live harmoniously, coexist harmoniously, if we cannot be grateful and we cannot be thinking of the greatness, uh, uh, kindness from our family, how can we live by with them every day? Right. expand from family, society, members, countries. If we can't think of each other's uh, kindness, each other's um, contributions or good side of them, how can we have a peaceful society? So for us, the Buddhist practitioner, if you want to be Buddha and Bodhisattvas, or as a pure land practitioner, you want to go to pure land, if you can't even be a decent human being, we need to ask, do we deserve it? I mean, can we have the guarantee to go to reborn in pure land? It's very hard, right? That's why it all starts from the roots, being a decent human being. And to build up a happy life, a happy family, a happy harmonious uh, society and a peaceful country, prosperous country, we need to start from this four. And this one word, gratefulness. If we see everything from this um, perspective of being grateful uh, and looking back at the Buddha's image, then we understand that Buddhism is truly not a superstition. Uh, it's not telling you to worship a sort of deity that grants you something. It's to ask you to be this role model. Uh, everyone, the reason we have a statute, an idol in any era is because this is something we look up to. Right? So this is the same meaning. If everyone is educated to be a decent human beings and practice it through role modeling from parents and teachers and in, in each other's, it's very easy to achieve what we call world peace that was being out of reach for so many years, right? And we, with, with this, you know, education, start with gratitude to each other. Only then we will not allow any hatred or any jealousy to overcome uh, our rational mind, our kind heart. So this is Buddhism. Gratefulness is Buddhism. Number two, learn from the best role models. Let's think about it, this word and then relate to Buddha, Shaemuni Buddha particularly, as a prince, crown prince to his uh, father's kingdom. He could have a very lavish life. He could have a best life that everyone been dreaming of. Why is he leaving all that behind? Go through this arduous journey of living under the trees every day. Back in India, and she, he's not even have, he doesn't even have a proper shelter every day. And then, how did he find food? Seeking alms, basically begging for food, in a in 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 frank manner. 
So his shelter is the trees. Let's not talk about 10 years, uh, 20 years or decades like Buddha did. Look at one day for us, right, to bring it back to reality in perspective. If we try to do what he did one day, not outside, not other countries, not different cultures, in your own country, in your own backyard, all right, in your own backyard, not outside of your property, under the trees, let's go under the trees, uh. <laughs> sleep under the tree one night, right? As exactly what Buddha did. Can, can we imagine that? Uh, our, uh, can you imagine that we do that without any problem to our bodies? Or not even not sickness, the comfortness. Imagine the comfort. How uncomfortable is this? Before he attained enlightenment, he was under the trees, not eating, not drinking. What is it for? Why is he going through all this suffering for? For himself? No. He's trying to get a way out of life and death, not just for himself, for everyone. Otherwise, he won't stay here and teach us this. All he thinks about is how do I lead all these beings from his era to the future, many, many thousand years from now, from his time, towards the liberation of life and death, liberation of these fundamental sufferings. On the other hand, we, most of us, ordinary people, we mostly think about ourselves or in our little groups, our families, but we, we can't think big. So, we must understand the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas image, their statutes, is to ask us to reflect, is to remind us artistically to reflect. You know, they didn't talk to you and tell you to reflect, they show it to you, let you decide, let you reflect. Uh, what kind of person do I want to be? And that's why we have image offerings. We offer the image, offers the statue of Buddha Bodhisattvas. When we look at the image of the Buddha, his peaceful face, his serene composure, what do we think of? Before I sleep, uh, I pray to Buddha three times. Every time I think of uh, Buddha and Bodhisattvas, I always reflect back to myself. What do I reflect in relation to the Buddha and Bodhisattvas? Always remind myself, educate myself, have I turned my thought? Has my thought turned kinder, purer, better? Is my action better, purer, kinder? Is the way I handle things thoughtful, considerate towards others? That's the whole point of offering to the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. Because humans are not saints, right? We are not saints. Human makes mistakes. We all make mistakes. We definitely have committed and we commit all the mistakes. But just because we're making mistakes doesn't mean we don't have a chance to overcome it and change it for better or improve. Back in my childhood, my mom told me all the time, it's not a problem for human, like human do not fear making mistakes, fear not making mistakes, but do fear of the unwillingness to change for better. So every day when we look at Buddha, Bodhisattvas, we educate ourselves one time. All right. I must change uh, my speech, my thoughts, my actions from unwholesome, evil, lustful, greedy, hatred into something pure, kind, wholesome, beneficial to everyone. So that is why we have imagery. Yeah. Sculpture ourselves, the best version of ourselves, with 
a role model in front of us. It, it's not superstitious from this angle. Do not treat Buddha and Bodhisattva as a deity, as gods. It's wrong and it's really disrespectful towards the Buddha if we do that. Because it defeats the purpose of them trying to educate us. As, even though there are so many meanings behind their image, their name, but it never depart from this goal to be grateful towards not just uh, towards them, towards their contributions towards human beings and all beings. Uh, that human contribution is huge, humongous, vast. Uh, these are the brief introductions in this chapter on imageries of Buddhism. So, knowing this, right, when we pray to the Buddha, uh, we must um, uh, understand we're actually praying to ourselves, best version of ourselves. Uh, if you just pray for that sculptured Buddha and Bodhisattva's image, it's superstition. If you think just like that, oh, I pray some sort of a image. Because this, they are made of wood, they are made of clay, sands. The point of doing this prostration every day is to say, I want to be the best version as shown in front of me. As shown as in the image of Buddha, Bodhisattvas. Uh, say there are so many Buddha's name, right? Amitabha Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, Medicinal Buddha, like Bodhisattvas as well. Uh, when we look at their names, we remind them of their virtues and remind ourselves to cultivate these virtues. Let's continue on the next slide. So, um, so many Buddha and Bodhisattvas, right? Last week I uh, mentioned it, right? Uh, in a uh, Tripitaka, you know, collections of Buddha Sutra. Uh, there are so many names, right? They have, even have sutra dedicated naming the names of Buddhas. And it's thou tens of thousands in, in volume. Uh, the point, a very important point they're trying to carry across this is to inform us our true nature the infinitude of our you know virtues capabilities wisdom good fortune and talents in you your true nature that's the point you have endless there's no boundary to your wisdom there was no, there's no boundary to your good fortune. There's no boundary to your capabilities, to your virtues, to your talents. That's the truth they're trying to bring across. However, why are we stuck in current predicaments, trapped from achieving our full potential? There's a saying in the Trisiani ceremony, you know, I am Amitabha Buddha. Amitabha Buddha is me. That's the truth. That's a reality, ultimate reality. And that's the point of how, why they have so much names of Buddha and Bodhisattvas. Because to ask, to tell you that you have such a vast range of endless range of meritorious deeds and meritorious qualities. Uh, in most truest sense of words, there are no limits. For example, for now, in this society, we have uh, someone with uh, high positions, with great capabilities, uh, with great wealth and talents. 
So, right, when we want to recognize this kind of person, when we want to introduce this kind of person of great talents, they will bring up their name card and say, I am, you know, CEO of this company. I am the directors of that board, you know. I have sat on so many, you know, positions, important roles in these companies and different companies. Why didn't he just say, I am a, you know, CEO of many companies? No, right? He bring up so many titles on this person. It's to show that he has a lot of capabilities, isn't it? Same for the names of Buddha and Bodhisattvas in multitudes. So back then, uh, I mean, Indonesia, back in Indonesia, um, uh, we also have the same thing like, uh, you know, the the mingpian, the name card uh, in the Dharma place. They also do that for my name. Uh, you have how many Dharma center, uh, what presidents of whatever uh, associations. Is that important? It's not important. It's good to live in a low profile, right? It's a good advice. The great, good, best advice says we should live low profile. Otherwise, you attract a lot of obstacles uh, if you're going high profile. I mean, good, uh, everyone knows you. Yeah, that means you lose your freedom in many ways. So back to the point. Um, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, for example. Shakyamuni Buddha is only one of his titles. Um, it's not just one Shakyamuni Buddha. There's stands of thousands of it behind it. There's so many, many names to describe him. And all this is to remind us our true heart, our true nature, our Buddha nature, our awakened nature has infinite uh, virtues, virtues, capabilities, infinite wisdom, infinite good fortunes, infinite talents. That's it. That's the point. When you chant Amitabha for every day, to remind yourself your capability is the same, equal as Amitabha Buddha, which is all this mentioned above. If we use the modern terms to describe the names and Buddhas, they are all talking about yourself. <laughs> All, all these Tripitakas in the sutras, they are all talking about yourself. When you chant Amitabha Buddha, you are actually chanting the qualities in yourself. Amitabha Buddha's quality in yourself. When you chant Shaimini Buddha, you are chanting his quality in yourself. When you are chanting Namo Dabi Kwan Sing Pusa, Avaloe Kitesvara, Aravaloe Kitesvara, you are chanting the name their qualities in yourself. So does Manjushri, Siddhikarpa, Mairetya, etc. So in short, it's all about how you reflect and how you change uh, your life. It has nothing to do with other people. Why do you have such a afflictive life? Why do you have such a stressful life, depressed life? It has nothing to do with anyone else. It's all about yourself. The, the key to change is all in yourself. We must believe that. Do you understand? Have you heard it clearly? When someone asks you, who are you? You must answer, I am Amitabha. Who are you? I am Guan Yin, Bodhisattva Guan Yin. I am... Avaloe Kitesvara. <laughs> Don't say I'm uh, Mr. Chai or uh, you know I'm 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 Joe and John Doe or something. No. You must be clear. On your true nature. What does it mean? If you can answer, say I am Amitabha Buddha. That means you have transcend <laughs> transcend the the me. 
you know, the ego, the, the, the shell that we are living in now, uh, the, the illusions that we're in now. So if I say, who am I, and I answer, I am venerable Shei Wu, then I'm still not there yet. Yeah. It's all about itself. We can talk about in relation to others. But ultimately, everything is surrounding this true nature. Yourself as in your true nature. Not the illusory shells. Mm. So, by saying the names, by reciting the names, by recognizing the names of these awakened um, people, to ask it, you can do that. You are like that. You are able to achieve that. Uh, Buddha's and Bodhisattva's names, the most important thing they represent is to educate us to cultivate the virtues. When we chant Avalokitesvara, Guan Yin, Manjushri, uh, Siddhigarbha, they are all telling us to cultivate the virtues they represent. Each of these Bodhisattva, they have like a flag a point of virtues they, they have mastered and trying to represent. Buddha represents your true nature, your potentials, a full rounded qualities. Bodhisattva represents the cultivations of the virtues to shown the light upon this true nature. That means the true nature appears when you cultivate these virtues. The merits of cultivation is what Bodhisattva means. One name of Bodhisattva uh, uh, represents one virtue that we should cultivate. If we don't cultivate these particular virtues, we can't open, shown the light of our true nature. Our true nature cannot come out. Uh, if we do not cultivate properly our capabilities, uh, what is what capabilities? Your good fortunes, your wisdoms, your perspectiveness. You cannot break through this threshold. You are stuck in that illusory shells, delusional, delusional shells. That's why we need to cultivate the virtues. If you want to go to pure land, uh, we saw the meritorious qualities in finite. If we don't cultivate properly, uh, if we don't chant his name properly to the depth of our heart, you can't achieve the happiness of pure land. A lot of people say, I want to live a long life. I want to be healthy. I want to be you know, wealthy and prestigious. So you don't want to have sickness. Uh, and also some people say, I want to have a good death. If one achieves this, especially good death, they have a good life beyond that. So where are the, all these good qualities from? How do we cultivate for this? How do we achieve this? All these things, sutras, all this knowledge we learn, they are just a way, they are a method. Like a few days ago, someone asked me, I want to be, achieve longevity. I told him, as long as you preserve your pre um, pre uh, as long as you hold the precepts of no killing, then you will achieve long life. Back in Shaiyamuni Buddha's time, there was one of the one of the venerable, hundred and six years old. Why did he achieve this long longevity, this merit? Because in his past life he has held on precepts of no killing. So Buddha's Bodhisattva, oh sorry, the Bodhisattva's name uh, represents uh, the merits of cultivating the virtues. Uh, Buddha represents our true nature, the, the, um, the inherent qualities of our true nature. Bodhisattvas 
asking you to cultivate. You have to improve. Buddha is to represent, to remind us your inherent qualities, which is well-rounded. There's no imperfection in there. However, you must go through what Bodhisattva did, which is cultivating this virtue to shed away the darkness that shrouds this true nature. And the person they're trying to talk to is yourself, no one else. Yourself. Just you. There's no second person in this. You must remember that. It's a very clear um, point they're trying to bring across in sutras. Uh, all the names of Buddha and Bodhisattvas are used to describe your true nature. So right now, knowing that when we cultivate Buddhism, what's the point? To be enlightened. Enlightened of our qualities and needs to cultivate for it. Once we understand this meaning, we understand that the way of Buddha teaching, we use the modern terms, sophisticated art. The way they teach is sophisticated. They don't just blab and, and talk all the time. Sophisticated art. We must understand that. The pedagogy, which you will see in the slides when we get there, is high-level wisdom. Pedagogy as in the way they educate, the, the method they educate. It's sophisticated. It's high-level wisdom. Once we understand, have achieved correct understanding of Buddhism, only then we are benefited from Buddha's teaching. This is a simple uh, introduction. So that we can all uh, understanding that, so we re really get in depth. Everything goes back to education. Truly. Is it easy to understand if I explain it in this way? Is it okay? Or if it's too fast? <laughs> because what I'm trying to achieve here is just a simple overview. Uh, because we all offer to the image of Buddha, right? Place offerings to them. Uh, don't just play every day without knowing why. Don't always think about, oh, I want to be rich and wealthy in front of them. Trust me, the more you ask, the less you get. Don't ask. Ask yourself, have I achieved the qualities, the, the cost needed, the cost and effect, right? The, 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 have I achieved the qualities required to retain the wealth? Positions, longevity. That's the point of offering to the Buddha and Bodhisattvas. So in um, Buddhism, there are four like Buddha and Busa Bodhisattvas, uh, and there are titles in our um, Buddhism. Akarya and Upadaya. So when we say Hershang, which is in Sanskrit of Upadaya, we keep saying the name Hersang, right, in the Buddhism, just the Chinese Buddhism, we, we mention it a lot. Especially when we take precepts or any, um, like eight precepts, right, when the Venerable Chan uh, writes ITE, uh, they start with Akarya. May Akarya knows my meaning. May Akarya witness this. 
in Buddhism, Akaya, Upadaya, or Hershang is reserved for really uh, uh, well, educations, uh, not religions. They are not used in religions. So what does Akarya and Upadaya means in these two? They are mostly used, they are commonly used. Some in Chinese um, Buddhism, we also have the called Dhamma Banaka, Fa Shi, a master and instructor of Buddha Dhamma. Number one is Upadaya. What does Akaya and Upadaya mean? Number one is Upadaya. So it's a Sanskrit word for mentor who personally mentor us or take charge in mentoring our educational development. In modern society, in modern educational terms, uh, it's a mentor. So we call these people uh, Upadaya, personal mentor. For myself, every time I go back to Indonesia, I always go and see my teacher in the mountains. My teacher, uh, I will call him Upadaya, Elder Upadaya. He's uh, 90 years old, very healthy. He's my teacher. He's my mentor. Like Master Ching Kong is also our Upadaya, He Shang, our Qing Jiao Shi, our mentor, personal mentor. So what's the difference between this teacher and the common teacher? This teacher is the one who affects you, who influences your educational development, personally take charge in your educational development. So uh, the meanings of uh, Upadaya is very deep. You see, in uh, everyday life, do you have a teacher? Yeah, I have a teacher. Even though he's not a monk, it's a it's a lay person. You can also call them upadaya. They are also hershang, even though they are not a monk, because they are your teacher. They take care of your educational development. In school, the person who's in charge of educating or implementing the curriculums and administrations is principles. Principle is the Upadaya. All these teachers, they are only performing educational tasks under his direction. Therefore, Upadaya uh, is actually principle, put it in modern way. So principle is very important because he is responsible over the success of the education program. Uh, so if you put the principle of modern day in Buddhism terms, they are Upadaya, they are Hershang. So, Hershang or Upadaya is not exclusive to monks. Everyone thought Hershang is monk. No, it doesn't have to be a monk. It's not necessary a monk. Hmm. Actually, Upadaya and Hershang, there's a process of translation through geographical region and they call it Kosha. Hence the name so different, the, the tone. Anyway, there was a case where, you know, the Upadaya is not doing their job. Uh, uh, not doing their job. As a result, Buddhism was being misunderstood by the society as superstitious, religious, and as the Kosha, as the Upadaya, they are all the same words. As Upadaya, if this educational group, we call it temple or whatever, is not achieving positive results in educating themselves and societies, especially in Buddhism, their karmic repercussion is very heavy. Uh, they are responsible for the failure of the education, and as a result, they will go to Avicii hell. So it's very serious. Mm. 
So Upadaya is not even exclusive to Buddhism. It's just like saying principle, principle of what, right? What this school of that school, right? You can be used in common societies, which was the case back in Buddha's time. As long as this person is in charge of your educational development, they are your upadaya, they are your hersheng, H-E-S-H-A-N-G, the opinion. When people call you hersheng, or ceremoniously call you hersheng, you are responsible, even for that ceremony, to, to go well. Do you have these merits, qualities um, to be revered as a upadaya? That's very important. We always remind ourselves when we will call this name, Hersheng. It's not a monk exclusive term. Uh, as long as this teacher is involved in teaching your or developing your educational uh, skill or developing you, educating you, so that you can be uh, beneficial to the society, then they are your upadaya. Is, is this explanation easy? Or uh, is it understood? So from now on, we understand what Hersheng or upadaya means. Let's continue to the next one, Akarya, Asha, Akar. Now this one is quite close, it's quite direct in tone. So in modern terms, Ashali or Akarya is the modern equivalent of, um, I mean, it's the Indian equivalent of professors. Uh, professor what? Professor what, right? Of this discipline. However, in Buddhism, it goes beyond just simply professors. Because Akarya has even more well-rounded way of saying, of describing it. Why? Why do we have a different approach? Because it's not a normal professor who transmits just the knowledge or technical skills. To be an Akaya, one must. Uh, so what distinguishes an Akaya with a professor? Because Akaya, to be one, must have uh, whole manners of speech, of deeds, of virtues, deserve to be a role model, deserve to be our role model. So it's a gui fan shi, in Chinese word, or in English, a role model. Everything they say, everything they do, everything they, they are virtuous, you can follow them. They go beyond just knowledge. They are teachers, but the, this teacher has virtues, real virtues, from their speech, from their thoughts, from their act, worthy to be emulated, worthy to be exemplified. A common professor not necessarily has these qualities, these virtues. They may be smart, but they may not have the virtues. But as an Akaya, one must have that level, that quality. It can be an example to you, the student, or to the society. Like Just like Australian of the Year, in a sense, contribution to the society. Uh, do you understand? When we have the eight precepts, when we receive the eight precepts, Akaya, may Akaya witness this thought of this. Uh, may Akaya, may we be in Akaya's thoughts. That means my action and speech must be in accordance to the precepts, hence an Akaya. May I be an Akaya. Like so today, Shaiyamuni Buddha's Buddhism has been transmitting for 3,000 years, according to the Chinese calendars. 3,000 years. Are there a lot of Buddhists who follow his teaching? Yes. However, no, however, sorry. Why is it still acceptable in modern society? Because of his virtues. If he just talk only, not walk, can anyone accept his teaching? No. Because it's not real. 
Right? If he didn't do it, if he didn't sit, uh, practice what he preached, no one would follow him. A person was well loved, well cared of, well respected. To be honest, it's not all about money. It's not about not all, all about positions. If that person worthy to be respect, to be loved, to be respected by the nation, it's because of his virtues. It's of his contributions to societies. His his virtues, his role modeling towards the society. If a person worthy to be respect, you must be a self-respecting person. You must be a role model. If you don't want to anger people and other people, we must have virtues. Especially this society nowadays, they get easily angered. We must have good dersing, which is virtues. It's not because I am number one, you're number two, or because I'm the gangster, you know, mafia boss, you're my subordinate. No, it's because you have achieved the quality of Buddha or anyone of virtuous nature. They have done something virtuous, they think virtuous, and people naturally respect them, flock to them and revere them as a role model. So from all these titles, Akariya, Ubadaya or Hershang, we understand Buddhism is an education, not a theism. They are not about worshipping a certain god. Even blunt way of putting it, religions are superstitious. Why do I say that? I will say that. I will explain it in next sessions. This is a simple way of understanding Buddhism. Uh, explain it simply so that we, un we understand all the terminologies uh, used in Buddhism's communities. Uh, akarya, Akarya. Okay, when I think of, from today's lesson, we learned that Akarya means to be an Akarya, my speech, my thought, my action has to be up to standard, has to be a role model. Only then I can be an Akaya. When people call it Akaya, we need to reflect that. Same for Upadaya. Or Hershon. So these are the simple, simply simple uh, uh, introductions to it, the terms. So next um, session, we learn about why is uh, religion uh, superstitious. It's a very big uh, discipline behind this, big knowledge, big un, um, meaning behind this. Why has religion become superstitious? So we'll continue that in the se next session. Because uh, next week we have the seven-day um, retreat, Amitabha Buddha name chanting retreat. So we would like to take a break after the seven-day recitation. So next week we'll take a break. I will continue after, uh, which is a fortnight, two weeks after. If I have done any, um, I mentioned anything in the uh, not right or doesn't, uh, please um, give me uh, criticism and feedbacks. Uh, point it out to me. Thank you, Amitho, for So let us uh, dedicate merits. I, the student of Buddha, would like to uh, dedicate the merits uh, towards the karmic creditors uh, to born in pure land. Uh, dedicate the merits to all beings, sentient beings, to liberate from sufferings. Repay the four kinds of kindnesses above. Relieve the suffering of those in the three paths below. May those who see and hear of this aspire to invoke the body heart and cultivate the teachings for the rest of this life. Then be born together in the land of ultimate bliss. Thank you. Amitofo. Let us all uh, pay respect to Buddha and the teachers by three prostration, and the venerable says, "Okay."
Thank you.